so now, before I uh, talk about the research that uh, is going on for Homo Cisternaria and, and a project uh, whereby we put together a, a research map and strategy, I want to show you a, a brief video. Uh, and Dr. Levy said something like, we no longer have the almost hopeless situation for HCU that we used to have. Well, this brief video is going to share the story of, of uh, my two sisters who were diagnosed back when homocystinuria was an almost hopeless case. And this was a, um, a brief video put together by my two adult children as a Christmas gift to me because they thought it could be useful for HCU Network America to build advocacy for why it's so important to treat um, homocystinuria. Uh, so, Emmanuel, how do I start the video, or do you? Oh yeah, so I got to is that the play right there? Oh, down. Spacebar works. All right, all right. I I'm um, Matt. Come on, Matt. Ah, I found it. Okay. Hi, I'm Margie McGlynn, and I'm a co-founder of HCU Network America, and I'm the president of the board of directors. I was inspired to start HCU Network America really to honor my two sisters, Judy and Susie. Judy and Susie were really sweet. They were both very kind. They both loved to play. Judy liked to laugh a lot. I'm Ed Hempling and um, I'm the eldest sibling in the Hempling family. And I was 11 years old when my sister, two sisters, were diagnosed. So I was in between Judy and Susie. I was two years younger than Judy and two years older than Susie. And I was four when they were diagnosed. I was kind of like a second mother to Judy and Susie because I was the oldest girl. Judy was diagnosed first at age six because she had issues with her eyesight. And they then tested for homocystinuria as they had recently become aware in the field of ophthalmology that displaced lenses were often a symptom of a genetically based disease, which is homocystinuria. She'd be right up on top of the TV almost, you know, when she watched something. They were about five and nine or four and nine. But by then, Judy had several things wrong with her. So they tested all of us in the family. Uh, there were six of us alive at the time. And they found that my two-year-old sister, Susie, also had homocystinuria. I know that my mother had voiced later that she was worried that they would say that Susie had it because they noticed that she had, you know, developed things a little bit slower. And, and, and it was determined then that Susie had it also but none of the rest of us did, which I could never quite understand. I always think like I felt a little guilty about that, like, well, you know, why them? And, you know, things like that. I, I remember feeling like I was spared and, you know, being in between the two of them, I remember thinking, well, why did my older sister get it and my next younger sister get the disease? And I didn't. They told me not to have any more kids before I had Joanne because it could happen again. And the rhythm system doesn't always work for everybody. I don't think we know what we were dealing with right back then. We were just getting information on it. There was no internet back then and this disease was not widely known whatsoever. I mean, homocystinuria, what does that mean to anybody? And if they knew more about it, it would have helped. Mm -hmm. But they were grasping like everybody else. They were, you know, pretty normal children. They played, they laughed. It was really over the, the next, you know, I guess eight years uh, that they, they continued to live that they became progressively worse and started to have issues like seizures, blood clots, etc. were in and out of hospitals. They had to, uh... One had trouble walking and cerebral palsy as symptoms, and the other one had speech and seemed to be a little slower behind and, and difficulty communicating verbally. I think at that time, you know, they told my parents to put them on a special diet. Yeah, they were experimenting with diet. Um, you know, this was 1964 when they were diagnosed, but they really didn't have the understanding that they have today. 
I think we were very hopeful, but they were deteriorating and to the point where mom was strapped in a wheelchair in a home and, my, you know, and they were always in a home. I may add, my mother was very loving and wonderful. I know some of the experts recommended that my parents put Judy and Susie into an institution that was designed to take care of mentally retarded, handicapped children, but my parents would not consider it. They were their children and they knew that they could take better care of them than anyone else could. And I really give my parents credit for helping them lead as normal a life as they could. So back then there was no support groups, no help, no one else to go to. We didn't know anybody else with this illness whatsoever. Um, and really nothing about it other than at a certain point they weren't going to live long. You know, as a child, you know, you, you know what death is, but knowing that a sibling that you're very close with is at risk of death at a very young age because of this disease, it's just really scary. I, you know, kept hoping that there could be medication for them. My father owned a pharmacy, was a pharmacist, and he was really frustrated that there weren't any medicines to treat them. Well, the year they died, I was 15. Susie died first, and she died on Joanne's birthday. Joanne was turning four. It was a weekday, because I was in school. And I was walking down the hall by the principal's office to go to my locker, we were changing classes, and I saw my brother in the office. He came out, and he said, um, I have to take you home. And I said, what's wrong? And he just said, Susie's real bad in the hospital. We got in the car, and as we were driving home, he told me that she had passed away. The message I want patients and families to get is that we are here to help. Let us help you manage this disease. Have hope, have confidence in the future, and we believe that by working together, we can help you or we can help your child to lead a much more normal and fulfilling life. I'm really proud of my children. I'm sure all of you that are parents, there are moments when your children do something that really touches you. And for my 26 and 24 year old daughter to put all the time and energy into this, and they're not done. They want to go further. They want to interview some of the experts today, like Dr. Chapman, Dr. Levy, some of the researchers working in the lab on new treatments. Uh, and they want this you know, video to be broadly utilized to help create greater awareness and support for homocystinuria. So as I you know, said at the end of the video, uh, I then decided to channel uh, my energy into what, what I'm calling my second career um, uh, to help patients with homocystinuria, to help make sure that no family or patient ever has to go through what, what my family went through. Um, my mother's still alive, by the way. Any of you that ever want inspiration, she's turning 89 in July. She'd love to talk to you if you're ever uh, driving through Buffalo or just want to get on the phone and talk to her. She is, uh, uh, as you saw from her uh, video clips, a real spirited, energetic individual. But uh, I don't want to ever you know, see another mother go through what my mother had to go through. So uh, I set up a fund called the Hempling uh, Foundation for Homocystinuria Research. And I did this about seven years ago, and I started to identify uh, academic researchers who were working on this, working in this field, who had promising projects that, if I could provide a grant to support a study, could potentially lead to proof of concept and lead to interest by a pharmaceutical company to license in uh, the product and, and hopefully bring it to market. Uh, well, I got lucky because the very first project that I funded was the enzyme replacement program that was being done by Dr. Krauss out at University of, of Colorado. Uh, and I have since funded um, four or five other projects, including uh, chaperone therapy, including gene therapy, uh, and a screening study that Dr. Mudd, uh, Harvey Mudd had asked me to fund that was being done over in, in Denmark. Uh, and, but I decided at, um, at one point to 
to really combine my resources and energy with HCU Network Australia, and we've come together now and we've said, let's not just have you know, piecemeal approaches to funding. Let's, let's do what other major patient support organizations do, uh, and let's figure out what's the right research strategy for homocystinuria, what are the most important priorities, and where something needs funding to get off the ground, let's try to fund it. And so this is a model that's been replicated. I think multiple myeloma was one of the first. Uh, I think they started in the late 80s when there really wasn't any research going on for multiple myeloma, and today there are many, many products on the market, and it's much more treatable than it was then. And this is being done for PKU. Danae has a lot of information on that. There are many grants that have been given out for PKU, and I know they have a, a new product coming to market or recently came to market. Uh, and so this is a very important um, priority for us now is, is HCU Network America and HCU Network Australia. So a little easier. So what I'm going to do in these slides is share with you the results of a project that uh, we embarked on a, a little bit over a year ago, and it was a, a joint effort uh, between HCU Network America and Tara Morrison's group in Australia. Uh, and we ended up hiring a consultant because a lot of the work that needed to be done, we, we needed expertise on. Now, I do want to make relevant disclosures. Those of you who attended scientific meetings, they always will say, is there any, any potential conflicts that would uh, make anyone you know, suspect that the, the information could be influenced by any other, um, any other associations? So uh, in the interest of transparency, I'll, I'll tell you that I, um, after I funded this project and it was licensed in by Orphan Technologies, uh -huh. They asked me to join the board because of my expertise and passion for homocystinuria, as well as my background in the pharmaceutical industry and bringing new products to market. But to make sure I have no financial conflict of interest, any board fees that I receive get donated to HCU Network America or to these specific research projects. So I believe that my participation will help HCU community because I'm able to bring the point of view of the patients and the advocacy uh, of the patient organization, uh, but it will also help by giving us um, additional funding that can help support our activities. And then as I mentioned, I've, I have funded some of these projects, uh, but I don't think either of those really in, in any way influence what you're seeing in this report, because this report was compiled um, first based upon all of the uh, therapeutic approaches that, that are going on out there, but also input from experts in the field, as you'll soon see. So we set out to say, let's map all of the research going on. I don't really mean a geographic map, although we have that information too, but, but really um, something that shows us by mechanism what type of research is going on and, and what's the status. But the real goal is not just to know what's going on. The real goal is to say what should be going on and, and what should the highest priorities be and where should we direct any funding that we're able to raise uh, and commit to this research. So the consultant first did a literature search. Uh, and I see some people taking photos. I'm happy to make these slides available if that helps anyone. In fact, Danae, I think we're going to make um, all of the slides available for the, it's all being recorded, all being recorded as well. But um, anyway, uh, the consultant first did a literature search to see what's been published on homocystinuria, um, as well as what's in the clinical trial databases. Uh, any clinical trial going on in the United States has to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So you can go there, search code word homocystinuria, and you will see the natural history study. And if you don't see the enzyme replacement therapy study, you soon will. You will see it. So that's posted, and, you know, and you'll see other things that had been posted in the past, such as the Turing study at University of Colorado. So we wanted to, to search that database, as well as there are some others internationally. Uh, but also to supplement this information, and this was really the, the guts of the project, to talk to global researchers and clinicians to get their point of view on all of the various projects that were out there, uh, but also what do they think the top priority should be. And so we show you here on the left, uh, the majority of those interviewed are actually working on uh, research studies, either in a lab um, and there was one at University of Colorado, which was a clinical study uh, going on. 
Uh, we also supplemented the um, more academic researchers with clinicians such as uh, Dr. Chapman represented the U.S. and Andrew Morris represented um, the U.K. and you know he's uh, European but also a global expert as well. We also reached out to the industry um, uh, partners who are working on any of these projects and we only interviewed them about their project because um, Having been in the pharmaceutical industry, if you ask someone about the competitor's projects, it's you know you're you're obviously um, you're going to hear a lot of enthusiasm for what they really believe in, and it's not that they're trying to be biased, but it's because they believe in what they're doing. So we didn't want uh, to have any any perceived bias, at least. We also had a project advisor, Dr. Victor Kosick in Prague, uh, was our advisor who reviewed um, all of the drafts of the report and. Um, and the final recommendations. So let me move ahead. I, I won't take you through this pathway, but I will show it because I'm going to come back and show you where the various projects fit into this pathway. But you know what this pathway is, and you've had um, at least two experts go through it with you. There are five different approaches uh, that are being investigated uh, that we're aware of, and hopefully there'll be six, seven, and eight um, in the not too distant future. Uh, the first you've heard about already, enzyme replacement therapy. What this does is replace the enzyme that's defective. A second approach, instead of delivering the enzyme, can you deliver the DNA that codes for the enzyme and enables cells within the body to express the DNA and to produce the enzyme? It's almost like having your own factory within, within your cells that can make the enzyme for you. A third approach, there are alternative enzymes, um, not the CBS enzyme, but two different alternative enzymes that you'll hear about uh, that can degrade methionine and or homocysteine directly. Uh, fourth, there are ways to activate the enzyme or the, or the protein uh, through trying to correct uh, faulty function, restore faulty function, or or activate the enzyme's activity. You'll hear about the early projects in that area, but um, I'll go through a few of those. And lastly, are there other approaches to address the metabolic pathway through nutrition or dietary approaches? So I will go through uh, each one of these, but first I'm, I'm showing on this slide where do each of these approaches fit into that biochemical pathway. Uh, the alternative enzyme that can metabolize methionine or metabolic uh, pathway modification at, at the level of, of methionine. Alternative enzyme that can metabolize homocysteine. Enzyme replacement therapy can replace homocysteine. Gene therapy enables the body to make that replacement enzyme and you can activate the, the protein or enzyme. And then lastly, you can also affect the metabolic pathway further down, such as uh, taurine uh, is the one product that's been tested. So I will now go through each one of these, and based upon the input from the experts, uh, I will share with you what they perceive to be the potential benefits of each program and any potential uh, weaknesses or limitations. This was not a consensus report. We didn't ask all 12 or 13 experts to come to agreement. I think that would have been impossible. And so um, what we're just trying to show are the varied opinions that exist on each of these programs. They all have merits. Um, every, every program um, that's out there in the world of pharmaceuticals has risks associated with it. So let's start with the pegylated version of the CBS enzyme that you'll hear more about in the next talk. Uh, which is a manufactured or synthesized enzyme uh, made in E. coli bacteria uh, given by subcutaneous injection. That's right under the skin as opposed to intravenous into a vein or intramuscular into a muscle. Uh, phase one, uh, hopefully you'll hear uh, a more precise date in the next presentation, but phase one expected to begin in 2018. Phase one is the first phase of testing in humans. So I don't believe this product has gone into any humans yet. Uh, they're shaking their head, that's correct. All the studies that have been done up to now are in animals, uh, and you might see some of that data in the next presentation. So what do experts believe the potential benefits could be? Well, clearly it's designed to lower homocysteine since you're replacing the enzyme. It should have uh, the same or better effect as dietary restrictions. So if it works, I'm sure you're already thinking, can I relax? 
or maybe even totally eliminate dietary restrictions to be determined, have to see what happens in the clinical studies. Um, and um, if this, it, it, this was shown to work in a mouse model and it brought homocysteine to near normal levels, which gave the experts uh, reason to be optimistic, but I've seen other examples of pharmaceutical products that work great in um, an animal model and don't work as well in humans. Uh, it would be expected to work for all CBS patients, regardless of what mutation you have, which is not true for some of the other approaches. Potential weaknesses. There are enzyme replacement therapies on the market today uh, for um, four or five different genetic diseases, and uh, they, are, they are reimbursed pretty well from what I understand in the United States. There are problems in uh, some other countries where the government pays for the delivery of, of all medications, uh, where they have had issues with reimbursement uh, because of the perceived cost-benefit ratio. Um, and so we don't know what the, the price is going to be, but if it's anywhere close to the other ends of replacement therapies. You know, on the other hand, the only way that there's incentive for a pharma company to invest in a rare disease, especially with small numbers, is to, is to be able to get reimbursed at prices that give them a return on that investment. So, you know, there's two sides to that, and I know companies that market the products available today, as I, I mentioned yesterday, of copay support programs to try to uh, remove any or eliminate any burden to patients. A uh, patient must be willing and able to do the subcutaneous injection, either themselves or, or a caregiver. Um, enzyme replacement therapy doesn't always work well in humans. Sometimes the, the body responds with antibodies to the enzyme, which can weaken its effectiveness and can also cause immune responses. So we really need the, the human data to have uh, greater information on this. So delivery through gene therapy or delivery of the, the DNA uh, this is a, an area that's being broadly explored for many genetic diseases. When I attended the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders meeting in, in San Diego last month, uh, gene therapy was talked about in terms of trials underway probably for eight, nine, ten different genetic diseases. So it's a very logical approach. If I have a genetic defect, can I introduce healthy or normal DNA to correct it? Um, but it still you know, has a long way to go for, for many of those areas. So the way you do this is the normal copy of the DNA is inserted into what's called an inactive biologic vector. In most cases, they're using um, the adeno-associated viral vector, which is a common cold, similar to the common cold, but it's inactive. It doesn't cause a cold or any other issues. It's just a delivery vehicle to get the DNA to the cells. Uh, and proof of concept, as I mentioned, has been shown in, in mice. Um, no, actually, I didn't mention that. I was talking about enzyme replacement therapy for that. Um, the proof of concept study for gene therapy is underway right now, and it's a collaboration. Um, this is being funded through the Hempling Foundation, a collaboration between Warren Kruger at Fox Chase and Ron Crystal at Cornell Wheel in Manhattan. Uh, and so, Hopefully within the next couple of months, right now they're finalizing the production of the vector and the, the gene. Hopefully we'll have mouse data to tell us whether this works and then hopefully there'll be a company interested in taking it further. So what the potential benefit? Well, it has a potential to be curative. Uh, could it be that a one-time injection you know, gives that DNA to the cells and it, it continues to provide the enzyme? Um, if it works, it, sh it should lower or even eliminate the dietary restrictions. Now, there are, are many um, cynics who say, oh, we've been talking about gene therapy for 30 years. It's never going to make it. There was a rough patch, uh, which was maybe 15 years ago, where uh, there was a, a death, actually, in someone in, in a clinical study at University of Pennsylvania, where they gave too high a dose of the, of the therapy. So they've learned a lot since then. The FDA put the brakes on this. A, a lot of additional work had to be done. But now there are several products moving safely um, through development. One was recently approved for retinal blindness, and there are others that are uh, uh, close to finishing clinical trials or uh, waiting for FDA approval. So I think we're going to see more and more over, over the next 10 years or so. Uh, but it's still an early stage, and you know there, there's going to be a, a lot of scrutiny of data to see um, are there any long-term negative consequences. 
or does the effect wear off over time? Do you have to readminister? And if you do need to readminister, it's likely you would have to change the product because you might have antibodies if you give the same vector that would reject it. And so all of those things have to be worked out. So this one is like the holy grail, high risk, high reward, may never happen, but I'm glad that we're able to at least uh, test it to see if it might be able to, to work. There are other variations I won't get into, such as gene editing. You've probably, those of you that read a lot of, of health medical articles have heard about CRISPR and gene editing. Uh, that will be explored over time. Gene therapy is a little bit sooner in, in, this, in the cycle, but the first gene editing trial may begin um, for other uh, genetic diseases in the next couple of months. So the third area, the alternative enzymes I mentioned that uh, don't replace CBS but give you a different enzyme uh, that can metabolize. Uh, the very first one listed here is arimethionase. Uh, which is uh, being researched by a company in Lyon, France called Aritech. And what they do is they take a bacterial enzyme called methioninase, they encapsulate it into red blood cells. Then you have to give those red blood cells to a patient via intravenous infusion. And the red blood cell will take up the methionine into the cell, will degrade um, the methionine and release byproducts. And um, that would be expected to lower methionine and homocysteine. So uh, Warren Kruger with his mouse model at Fox Chase Cancer Center um, did a, a proof of concept study. There was a poster presented at a medical meeting last year. I checked in with the company to ask the, any update on status. They said the, the project is currently on hold as they work through some technical issues, but I will tell you that happens to every project in pharmaceutical development. Um, issues come up over the way. So I'm, I'm hopeful it, it will you know, move forward. Um, if it works, the potential benefits obviously could lower methionine and um, subsequently homocysteine, mimic the effect of dietary restriction, may therefore reduce or eliminate dietary restriction, would again be expected to work for all CBS patients. Uh, weaknesses. Well, the IV infusion is, is something that you'd have to go to a physician's office or a clinic uh, maybe at least monthly and could be more often. Uh, as it is a bacterial enzyme, will your immune system develop antibodies against that and could that lead to allergic or anaphylactic reactions? Uh, and it will not restore the CBS enzyme function, so those downstream metabolites, um, such as cysteine, uh, would not be restored to normal levels un unless you supplemented. Uh, and the potential cost is unknown. The next uh, alternative enzyme is uh, from Aglia, who's represented uh, in the room here today, uh, and uh, it's called homocysteinase, and I think they named that because that is not an enzyme called homocysteinase. Uh, this is a synthetic or recombinant uh, human enzyme uh, where they, they took another um, enzyme and made some, it's called point mutations, uh, and, and this is designed then to metabolize homocysteine and it may also uh, potentially metabolize methionine. So it would be expected to lower both, whether it does both directly or, or methionine indirectly is, remains to be seen. This is also in animal studies. Uh, proof of concept was shown in mice. I believe there's been a um, publication or, or poster presented on, on this. So potential benefits of this product, again, it would be expected to lower homocysteine, mimic the effect of diet, reduce or eliminate dietary restrictions. Should work, if it does work, it should work for all CBS patients. Uh, and also a, a potential usage, and I think it was Dr. Chapman that, that gave me this input. Uh, if you do need acute lowering of homocysteine, such as during surgery, this could potentially be useful for that. Uh, potential weaknesses, well, the, it may require an IV injection at least monthly at the hospital or physician's office. Uh, could always trigger an immune response since it could be perceived to be a foreign substance and cause allergic reactions. Again, doesn't restore the CBS enzyme function so the, the downstream deficiencies aren't corrected. And again, the potential cost is unknown. The fourth area has um, three different examples of how you could activate the CBS protein, and I won't get into all, all the distinctions between them, but the first category is, is called chaperones, and those are compounds that bind to a faulty enzyme 
to help restore the enzyme activity. An enzyme, and experts correct me if I get this wrong, but an enzyme is a protein that folds into a three-dimensional structure. So imagine, you know, that protein may have long, you know, appendages. It comes together and folds, and it's able to exert its enzyme activity. Well, if it has a defect somewhere, it, it may fold, unfold. It may not be able to properly fold, so it might not be able to restore that activity. A chaperone is a compound that can attach at just the right place. They design it, you know, so that they, they pick the chemical structure that will attach at just the right place to stabilize that. So maybe it can form like this and exert the enzyme activity. So it's, um, it's a very elegant concept, uh, but, and it has been shown uh, to work for other diseases. There are uh, chaperone compounds on the market for Fabre, another genetic disease, um, and then cystic fibrosis, a, a genetic disease. So the, the only one I'll talk about here, there have been a few studied, but uh, there's a compound called bimoclamol, uh, which is being developed by Orphozyme, which is a Danish biotech company, and it's being developed for another genetic disease, neiman picks disease. And so we're interested in exploring it for homocystinuria, and so uh, Warren Kruger got a grant from Nord in their last round of, of grant funding. Um, his proposal was chosen for homocystinuria, and he is studying this, uh, but he's studying it in combination with a compound you'll see on the next page, bortezomib, because he already synthesized this on his own and studied it. And on its own, he didn't think it worked well enough, uh, but he has reason to believe that combined, it would have a better effect. Uh, so, if this works, um, you could have, you know, broad activity uh, and a convenient oral formulation, which, which would certainly be, not be nice. But as I said, on its own, it didn't work that well um, in the mouse model. Also, it's unlikely that a chaperone would be effective for all defects because, as I said, depending upon where that defect is and what part of the enzyme or the protein it's impacting, um, it, it, it just isn't designed to, you can't design a chaperone that would work for all defects. You would probably have to have multiple ones. Uh, but perhaps it could work for the most common or the most severe uh, would be the most important defects. So the, the second category is called proteasome inhibitors. And these products bind to the enzyme and protect it from getting degraded. Uh, because if the enzyme gets degraded, which happens, you know, nor normally, but in, with a genetic disease, it may be e extensively degraded, or with very little enzyme, you want to preserve what you have. And so if you're able to enhance that residual enzyme activity you have, that could be very beneficial. And um, there's a compound called bortezomib, which has been on the market for years in the brand name Velcade and used for multiple myeloma. And Warren Kruger showed um, in a, a study the Hempling Foundation funded years ago, he showed that bortezomib worked in 16 out of 18 of the defects that he tested. The problem, though, is that it would have to be given lifelong, and it, it does have a lot of side effects. So what Warren is doing in, with his Nord grant is he is looking at a low dose of bortezomib to, uh, to avoid the side effects to see if that could be combined with bimoclamol. And bortezomib um, is either off patent or going off patent, so that, that provides an avenue to develop it even if the originator company wasn't interested in it. And so, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, there are other proteasome inhibitors being developed for cancers that may make them available for us to, uh, to test over time. Now, uh, it again, may only work for defined mutations um, we don't know the cost, and it could require frequent IV infusion. So, you know, a, a different molecule, a different compound, a different proteasome inhibitor might be preferable to bimoclamol, and the safety hasn't yet been established. So the third category um, is called a, a stabilizer of the enzyme regulatory domain, and I won't even try to explain what that means, but. Um, you know, the expert working on it, uh, Tomas Machen at University of Colorado, who's also working on the um, enzyme replacement therapy, uh, could tell us more about it at some point. So this compound binds to the regulatory domain of the enzyme that regulates um, how that enzyme functions. And it can help stabilize the enzyme, um, help with refolding, uh, or it can activate the mutant enzyme. 
So, you know, if this works, um, you know, that could help to make the enzyme last longer and have more efficacy and therefore lower homocysteine and, and relieve some of the dietary restrictions. Again, may only work for a small number of patients with defined mutations and the potential cost is unknown. The status of this is that uh, Tomas has a grant from the American Heart Association, which is interested because of the cardiovascular effects of, of homocystinuria, cardiovascular consequences. So he is testing different analogs, different chemical structures that are closely related to SAM, uh, which, you know, to see which works best, and if he's successful, this could go on to, to further stages of testing and development. And the, the last area would be to modify the metabolic pathway. And Victor Kosick had a, um, a concept on um, dietary modulation, uh, but there's no sponsor available right now, so he, he doesn't know that that will move forward. So I, I, won't, I won't go into that in any detail. The second is, I've already mentioned, taurine. Were, were any of you uh, enrolled in the clinical trial that tested uh, taurine? Anyone in the room? Okay. We have one, Kristen. So taurine is contained in Red Bull, a high caffeine drink. Uh, but you know, you saw it on the biochemical pathway. It's you know the lower end of that pathway, and there was a hypothesis that this may help with homocystinuria. And so Ken McLean was doing this research out at University of Colorado, and I believe the. Um, Hummel, Will Hummel Foundation. Tara, or can you validate? I believe you provided some funding for the study. Yes. Um, and so this study was done, and um, it did show that in a subset of patients who had abnormal endothelial function, and that endothelium in, in the blood vessels, that it did provide um, a positive effect. So this would be considered a pilot study. It was a small scale study done with very short term administration would need to go on to a larger study, and discussions are going on at University of Colorado to see if they think that's, that's feasible and if funding would be available. It's unknown if it would have a positive benefit for all CBS patients, uh, but it would be expected to have a, a, a good safety profile. It is available orally, low cost. I don't know what Red Bull costs. That might not be the right dose, so don't go out and start taking Red Bull, for that reason at least. Um, but you know it shouldn't be you know very expensive if it does work to uh, to get it developed. So let me come back now that I've taken you through not only the five approaches but the specific projects within each approach, and show you where they fit into the metabolic pathway. Arimethionase um, affects uh, degrades methionine, sulfur amino acid dietary modulation could also impact here. Homocysteinase can degrade homocysteine. Uh, ERT, gene therapy, chaperones, proteasome inhibitors, and the stabilizer of the regulatory domain all work at the level of, of replacing CBS enzyme or helping CBS enzyme function better. And then taurine comes in at, at the bottom end of the pathway. So what did our experts say about all of these? Well, first, the experts were very happy to, to see that there were as many projects going on as there are, and so you know, we were we were pleased as well, um, and so the experts gave us their their opinion on what they thought the future priority should be uh, for us to fund research and for us to uh, be advocates uh, for more research to happen. And the first column is well, even before you come up with new approaches, is there something you can do to optimize the current approach to therapy? Uh, first, we need long-term outcome study. The natural history study will give us new data, which will be very, very helpful uh, to see what's happening with the improved standard of care we have today versus what existed um, in 1985 and before the last natural history study was done. Um, improving quality and taste. It was great to see the taste test last night. Um, I wasn't told whether one or two won, um, but it's great to see the, the companies that make the supplements and medical foods are working to come up with better versions that, that patients will, um, will be more pleased with. Um, clinical studies to further define the approach. It, as when Kim talked about the guidelines, she said, you know, there really isn't data available to tell you what exact level of homocysteine you should be targeting or exactly how much of a, a given supplement should be given. 
And so clinicians do their best with available information, uh, but, but there, are, there are additional studies that could be useful. And I, I think Dr. Levy mentioned this, the quality of life is very important. How do we measure um, how your lives and, and you know, your children's lives are currently impacted by homocystinuria and how could a better approach change that? That can be very helpful when you're trying to get approval from regulatory agencies for a product to show that there really is a detriment in quality of life. And it can be very important for uh, payers, those who reimburse for therapies, to see uh, that that you know, really is uh, better. Now, in this case, payers could say, okay, this drug costs X thousands, tens of thousands, whatever it is per year. Well, you know, you can control homocystinuria with diet, so why should I pay for this? Well, quality of life is not ideal, as you all know, and, but we, we have to be able to prove that. Uh, the second category we've talked a lot about, how do we better detect uh, CBS deficient homocystinuria. We have to improve newborn screening. What can we do? And I'll, I'll mention the project that um, Dr. Chapman referred to earlier on, on a subsequent slide. How can we not only catch more patients at birth, but what can we do down the road? If someone has a developmental delay, delay someone has an ophthalmic issue, um, how do we make sure that they're sent for the right next test right away? Um, surveys have been done of other genetic diseases, and Tara Morrison, Australia, has some data for HCU that shows that that diagnostic journey can take three or four years. How do we get it to take three or four weeks, three or four days, three or four hours? It, it's a dream, but I do think there are things we can do, and we have on our list of priorities down the road. How do we work with some of these um, other physician specialties? I think op ophthalmologists uh, pretty much know if someone has displaced lenses, what to do. And in fact, um, you heard in the video, we were lucky in 1964. I mean, we we're you know, very unlucky what happened to my sisters did. But they were, the ophthalmologist sent my parents right to Children's Hospital in Buffalo in 1964. That must have been a well-read ophthalmologist because that case study came out in 1963. So we were fortunate. A lot of, of families aren't so fortunate. So what can we do to educate physician societies? Hematologists, 20-year-old with a blood clot, test homocysteine levels. Developmental delays, test homocysteine levels. So we're going to work to see could we make a homocysteine test part of every middle school physical. I, mean, I don't know that that's the right answer. Uh, or you know, even going off to kindergarten. Um, we're going we're to work on that. Uh, and you know, to improve the overall understanding of the disease as well as uh, create, uh, to know how many patients really are out there, to be able to find them, to be able to connect with them, and to increase overall awareness. Then in terms of new treatment modalities, uh, the experts say, number one, we need safe oral therapies, easy to use, uh, can be taken you know, on a hopefully once a day basis and avoid dietary restrictions. And they mentioned chaperones as an example, if, if that technology were to pan out, could be an oral therapy. Um, enzyme replacement therapy, they were, they were excited about. We need human data, uh, whether it's a CBS enzyme directly and or alternative enzymes, let's replace right at the source of where the issue is and correct the entire metabolic pathway. Um, gene therapies, as I said, that's you know the holy grail one-time curative approach could be uh, feasible, uh, high risk, high reward, but worth exploring. So what do we do with all of this information? So HCU Network Australia and HCU Network America came together and said, uh, let's convene a scientific advisory board. That's the right way to set up a global grants program. Let's pull together a group of experts and let's then get their recommendations on what our priorities should be, put out a call for proposals globally through many different um, you know, networks of researchers, through the different societies, through the different list servers, et cetera, and let's say that we're willing to fund uh, research proposals for two priority areas, improving the approach to newborn screening and a novel approach. We didn't limit it by mechanism. What's the best novel approach out there that can reduce dietary restrictions? So we sent this out um, in November of last year. We then reviewed the expressions of interest. We didn't ask for the complete proposal just to limit the amount of, of uptime 
uh, work um, that needed to be done until we knew something was, was worth fully exploring. And we then uh, asked two researchers to send us a full proposal, which will be coming to us in May. We'll review that with the advisory board, and we then intend to provide award grants. Um, HCU Network Australia has committed to 40,000, uh, and we've committed, and I'm, I'm doing this through the Hempling Foundation, but it will go through HCU Network America so that we can get the HCU you know, name behind this uh, to fund. And so these projects would then take up to a year to complete. Um, and you know, just a little bit on each one of them, they, I'll really only talk about the improved approach to newborn screening. That would be a direct measurement of total homocysteine right on that initial card. You wouldn't have to go to a second card, added time, added cost, added expense. We could not get the endorsement to do that because of just the number of priorities that are out there for newborn screening. Uh, and so there's some data that shows that uh, using different reducing agents, if we have any chemical engineers in the room, uh, might avoid the technical issues they had with trying to measure homocysteine on that upfront card. So we're excited about that one. That could be a real game changer. Uh, and hopefully um, we're also bringing in one of the, the companies that works in this field of diagnostics so that they could start to think about how could this be, be, then be commercialized. Uh, and the second one, I won't get into exactly what it is for confidentiality reasons from the researcher, but a, a different approach, which is, which is more addressing the, the metabolic pathway. And so additional steps we've planned. Um, other, other patient advocacy organizations that want to support research launch pretty extensive fundraising programs. I think the PKU National Group uh, has activities that get organized on a local level uh, gala events, all sorts of walks and different activities that take place to raise money to support research. We'd like to get to that point over time. We're going to need your help uh, to raise additional support because we're just touching, you know, the surface with the two proposals we're able to fund here. Other organizations will commit a couple million dollars a year to research funding, and a lot of progress has been made in short order by, by doing so. So we want to build upon this, but I think we have a pretty good um, beginning. Uh, we also, as a patient advocacy organization, will continue to work directly with the companies involved in the field. It is our goal to support every potential product that could come on the market for homocystine area with whatever advice, support, connection to patients, et cetera, that, that we can do. So, so we're here to help, and we'll, we'll do the same with academic researchers. And we'd also like to see more um, young research coming, researchers coming up through the system to start working in this area. So we might need to come up with some special grants program to, to do that. Um, lastly, we were asked about including other causes of homocysteine area, like cobalamin, methylation disorders. We had a focus because this was a pretty significant undertaking and um, cost a fair amount of money to get done. Uh, but over time, if we are able to pull some more cobalamin families into our network and methylation disorders, and they're able to help us raise funding, we're, we're more than willing to, to go on and address other causes of HCU. So that's all the information I intended to present, and I, I want to end with thank yous. There are a lot of people that made this possible. Our consultant did a, a terrific job. It's an MD, PhD with a lot of experience in rare disease drug development. Uh, Tara Morrison was a, a great co-sponsor, both financially and uh, uh, her enthusiastic um, you know, advocacy and, and help along the way. Our scientific advisor, who had to review many drafts, uh, and uh, many changes over time with English as his second language. So if you ever have a chance, I know uh, Dr. Levy and Chapman uh, will talk to Victor Kosick from time to time. Please, please thank him. He's, he's just terrific. The experts we interviewed, all of whom are listed here, and the scientific advisory board is, is shown here as well. And we thank them for their time. We met at the uh, Rio International Meeting of, of Metabolic uh, or Inborn Errors of Metabolism. And lastly, I'd, I'd like to thank my sisters for inspiration. Um, hopefully, as I said, um, no patients will ever have to endure the suffering they did, and families won't have to either. So something good will come of it. So thank you for your attention. Be happy to take a few questions.
Any questions? Janae will bring you the microphone. Oh, come on. Someone has to have questions. So you all <laughs> thoroughly understood everything I said. Uh, here's one uh, right back, second table there. Oh. oh, second table. He's coming towards you. Oh, okay. It's like. <laughs> I guess the only concern I would express is for people undergoing any of these therapies, that would require them to go off their diets and, and the medications they're taking uh, just to gauge the effectiveness of the therapy. I assume that to be the case. Um, I'm only going to let the Orphan Technologies uh, presenter address this. That's not necessarily the case, uh, but you'll, I'll let them share that with you. Oh, did, oh okay. Uh, it was no, oh. in their presentation. Oh, in their presentation. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> the no, one thing I'll mention is a lot of them, um, a lot of studies from my experience, not that I've participated in them, but what they look for is a lot of patients that are already off diet too or have struggle with control. Um, so I would not be a candidate. It's very frustrating because I tend to be in very good control. But they're looking for people that really need these medications and drugs yeah. and therapies. Yeah, that, that's not the approach being yeah. taken here, but let's, uh, let, let's let them um, respond to it. Um, I can't remember which uh, therapy this was re uh, relative to, but um, in classic HCU, is it that it's a um, deformed enzyme or the absence of the enzyme? It's a defective, defective enzyme. Well, a defective gene, so does the enzyme actually form? I mean, does it fold, but then immediately unfold? So it depends on the mutation. Yeah. Do you make enzymes? So that's what you're trying to do. Right. So in some cases, people don't make it. Danae, do you want to bring the microphone over to so, Tim? Uh, you're asking about, like, the chaperonins and the, the modulators. So, so there's several levels of uh, defective enzymes, okay? The first level is you don't make the enzyme at all, right? So it just doesn't make it. But that's actually only if you get about halfway through the enzyme and the enzyme doesn't keep going. In most cases for many diseases, it's actually the enzyme is defective. And what happens is it comes up and it's gotta get folded in a particular way. And because the enzyme is made, but it can't get folded, it gets eliminated right away. And so the chaperones and the modulators all are dependent on having an enzyme made. So you can have classical homocystinuria where the enzyme is made, but it's de it is destroyed very quickly because it's identified as, oh wait, this is wrong because it can't fold, so we're gonna get rid of it right now. Um, and so you may not be able to detect that that enzyme exists, but it may still actually be there for a tiny period of time. If you catch it in that tiny period of time, get it refolded so it doesn't attract the thing in our cells that say, oh, this is a bad made enzyme, we have to get rid of it, then that enzyme, then you could actually use a chaperone. And that is part of the reason that type of technique is dependent on the mutation, right? Because if you don't make enzyme, none of that works. If you do make enzyme, that's a possibility. And then where is the abnormality within the enzyme will dictate whether a uh, modulator works because is it something that I need to make B6 bind better or is it something that I have to change the active group or is it this enzyme is just so badly folded that it gets rid of right away. And so that's also why it's dependent on what the change is. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. One last question. I saw a hand in the back corner, and then we'll go on to the next presenter. Um, and I'm sorry if this is on the website and I haven't found it, but now that with the 501c3 that you're now the nonprofit, um, and we have done, my, my family did, has done just fundraising in general, started little small fundraising um, over many years, but is there directions on how to help with the donations. I know a lot of the fundraising we do, people are interested in the tax write-offs. Is right. that on the, f the website, that maybe a direction on how to? In there is also a donate tab. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on our website, there is a donate button, 
and there is a donate tab because I know not everyone feels comfortable donating electronically, so you can um, you can mail in a check as well. Yeah, but if you're looking for additional information, we do have our EIN number. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's needed for someone to get a you know if you're yeah. using a charitable fund to get a tax deduction. But if there's any other information you need, Danae can make that available. And one of the things we're hoping to do is to uh, provide greater support on our website so that the community can all put together fundraisers. So I know we've looked mm -hmm. at different options to, to do that, but we'll be working on that more over time. Thank you. Thank you.